Well, good morning. Let me add my welcome to Simon's. Uh, if you're new or visiting especially, it's great to have you with us. Um, and we're looking at this uh, three-week series that we're going to start today on marriage. The reason we're doing that is because it's likely that there'll be a national plebiscite. Uh, it sounds like early next year now. Um, but it's an important topic. I think we're going to hear a lot about this in the next six months. Um, so we're going to look at some of the foundations uh, from what the Bible sets out. Um, but also consider, I guess, the question of what's at stake uh, in any changes, and we'll particularly focus on that in the third week. Uh, but today, looking at these two foundational passages from um, Genesis 1 and 2. Now, usually each term, uh, we work through a book of the Bible, and um, we'll be doing that again in fourth term. But for this third term, as we occasionally do, we're going to be looking at some topics or themes. So there'll be this three-week series on marriage, and then there'll be another uh, six-week uh, series on the church that will follow that. Well, let me pray for us as we um, come to God's word on this important topic and ask that he might really help us as we grapple uh, with this important theme. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a faithful God who have revealed yourself to us in your word and ultimately through the person of your Son. And we see that from the very beginning that you had clear plans for humanity and we ask as we reflect on the foundations of marriage this morning that you might give us clarity about your blueprint that you've laid out for us and that you might help us to respond to your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, in her book, uh, The Essence of Family, the Australian Christian writer Kirsten Burkett uh, offers the following assessment of our society. In this self-centered world, she writes, we're suffering loss of relationship. People crave relationship, security, love and companionship. But these things do not come automatically. Some have given in and accepted that lifelong singleness, perhaps punctuated by a few affairs, is the best to hope for, that single parenthood may as well be the norm. Most, though, continue to fight for things such as family and home, but without being prepared to give up their self-worship often. And it's time that we realise that these two values together are impossible to hold. Well, as we commence this uh, three-week series on marriage in the lead-up to what looks likely a national plebiscite on the topic, is this summary of the state of play in Australia too harsh? Is it too harsh? Let's consider some of the raw data uh, for a moment. You know, over the past two decades in Australia, marriage rates have been declining while divorce rates have increased. Unfortunately, of the 121,000 marriages that commenced in 2014, which is the latest ABS data, uh, nearly 40% or 46,000 of those marriages will finish in divorce. And of those marriages that end in divorce, um, about 50% will have children. Meanwhile, de facto relationships have risen steadily in the Australian population over the last 15 years. Uh, data from 2011 census indicates that there were 1.2 million people in de facto relationships, people 15 years or over, and 34,000 uh, same-sex couples amongst those figures. De facto relationships now account for about 15% of um, those living in partnered relationships in Australia. And when you add in those who remain unpartnered throughout their life, it's now the case that a third of Australian men and a quarter of Australian women will never get married. And not surprisingly, that has resulted in some uh, changing family structures within Australia. One article written for the Australian Bureau of Statistics uh, states this. Increases in the proportion of babies being born outside registered marriages and increases in cohabitation provide evidence that a registered marriage as the traditional social institution for family formation is declining. That's our government summary. Well, I don't know about you, but I find that to be a scary report card. And I don't raise those figures, you know, to wag a righteous figure at our society and say, tut, tut. But in order that we might grasp the great contrast between what is happening in our world already and what God intended for us. 
I want us to hear God's blueprint for marriage and the family and it's uh, in all its glory with fresh impact as we think about why the logic of what God has set up is so compelling compared to that which we've engineered for ourselves in our modern wisdom. And that brings me to a first point. Point one, a helper for a joint task. Well, let's consider what God has to say about marriage. Point one, a helper for a joint task. So notice again what is stated in verses 18 to 20 of Genesis 2. The Lord God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now this is a, a crucial section of scripture which contains the reasoning for the creation of the first woman and the first marriage, her marriage to the first man, Adam. Now against the sevenfold and the Lord saw and it was good in chapter 1, suddenly we have something that's not good for the first time. And it draws our attention, it's startling in verse 18, that there's something not right with God's creation. The sudden negative alerts the reader to the importance of a helper for the man who's a fitting partner for a joint task. What is this joint task? Well, in verse 5, um, the man has been told to work the ground, that there was no one to work the ground. In verse 15, he's placed in the garden to take care for and uh, to work and to take care of it, or literally to guard and to till it. And verse 18 doesn't so much highlight the man's loneliness as a result, but rather that he is alone in the task of caring for God's creation and he needed help. Now, more on that joint task in a moment. But notice firstly that we're told here that Adam's companion needed to be a helper suitable for him, which is literally in the Hebrew, the opposite of him. The opposite of him. It expresses this notion of complementarity, one who is different rather than identical. Alike, yes, but not the same. But despite God's identification of man's need, there's this delay in the provision through this little section we feel uh, that this is heightened by the man being asked to name all the animals, but no helper is found for him, we're told at the end of verse 20. And so suddenly in verses 21 and 22, the creation of the woman from the man's rib supplies what was missing. The task of finding a suitable helper is solved by God himself through his creative power. And we're told then God brought her to the man. And so the person... The partner created by God is introduced to Adam, who's very passive, isn't he, in this matchmaking process, as it were. But then he responds in verse 23. God's success in providing a complementary partner for the man is acclaimed in this very poetic outburst. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So we're fearfully and wonderfully made, the Bible tells us in Psalm 139, and I think we see something of that expressed here in the joy and the wonder of the man as he brings the woman to him. But that brings me back to this question of what is this joint task that humanity has been given, this joint task that men and women are entrusted with? Well, it was read for us before in Genesis 1.28 most clearly. Remember what was written there. It will come up again on the screen. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So the joint task that men and women are given is twofold here. Notice, firstly, they are to fill God's world with offspring and secondly, they are to rule God's creation under him. And so these two commands or creation ordinances are given before the fall. God has given these tasks to humanity before sin has entered the world. And the two commands are linked. You know, given the size of God's creation that's teeming with animals and vegetation, it's going to need more than one person to rule this. It's going to require lots of people, in fact. 
As Christopher Ashe has noted in his book, Married for God, we are male and female so that we may use our maleness and femaleness in joyful service of God in the government of his world. As he goes to point out, marriage is not simply created to serve us, but rather marriage is created for us to serve God's purposes for his world. And so this obviously cuts across uh, the attitudes, the views of our society today. But God's design for marriage means that our marriages should not be self-oriented. For example, it's unfortunate that in our Western society, children are often regarded as an inconvenient byproduct of our sexuality. You know, the Bible doesn't view children as an inconvenience or as an imposition, but as a great blessing from God. And marriage is the stable, nurturing environment in which families can be raised, a family unit can be formed. Now, what does that all mean as we think about the potential plebiscite? I want to apply this first point in this way for you. I want you to realise, and you've probably already heard it clearly in the last 12 months, where people want to have a very strong theme in the ongoing marriage debate that marriage has got nothing to do with children. Marriage has got nothing to do with children. It's just about two people being able to do what they want. Well, the head of the Australian Christian Lobby, uh, Lyle Shelton, stated on his blog this week that I was on Sky TV on Sunday night and I debated the co-chair of the Australian Marriage Equality Group, Alex Greenwich. Again, I was told by him that children have nothing to do with marriage, despite many same-sex marriage proponents pushing for commercial surrogacy to be legalised. Now, sure, some heterosexual marriages don't produce children, but every child that does exist has a mother and a father somewhere. The government has no business in regulating our friendships or our love lives, but the reason marriage law exists is because governments rightly are interested in protecting the rights of children. The purpose of marriage law in part is to provide a legal and cultural incentive for men and women who produce children to stay together for the benefit of those children. Now people are free, he wrote, to love whoever they want, but changing marriage law has consequences of changing our legal and cultural assumptions about mothering and fathering. Same-sex marriage would make it impossible to assert that children, wherever possible, should be allowed to be nurtured by their biological mother and father. Now, yes, he writes, children sometimes miss out on a father or a mother because of tragedy or desertion or the breakdown of a marriage, but government policy should not mandate this. I think this is a very strong point that we need to think through as this deba debate continues. The place of children as we think about the laws surrounding marriage. And that brings me to a second point. Point two, marriage made in heaven. So notice again um, verses 24 and 25 as we come to the climax of this passage, this blueprint of God for marriage. Verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So here, verse 24 spells out God's blueprint for marriage. And there's three steps. But notice, firstly, this indicates that the nature of marriage is an exclusive relationship. And the first thing to note about that is that it's not an institution created by the church. It's not an institution created by secular governments. It's an institution created by God. It's his idea. It was God who implemented marriage for the first couple, Adam and Eve, in the creation account. God is our designer who knows what's best for us, installs marriage. Now, marriage is often seen today as just a legal contract you know, which we can adjust the laws of to suit our society's current thinking. We're going to come back to that issue in some depth in a couple of weeks. But here, notice firstly, the Bible's huge claim, huge claim to our society, is that to accept marriage is to accept God's plan for us in this regard. Now, there are three key phrases I know. 
Uh, firstly, leave his father and mother. Secondly, be united to his wife. Thirdly, one flesh. Well, let's have a look at each of these in turn briefly. Now, firstly, the leaving. It, it talks about the need for the man to have left his father and mother before being married or united to his wife. Well, we've got to be clear that God's stating that marriage creates a new family unit, which is independent of the authority that our parents had over us as a single person, as single children, in the sense that our marriage relationship is now the priority relationship. Now, of course, we're still called to honour our parents. Uh, that's something that continues throughout our life. But our marriage must take first place. It is the new family unit that is formed at that moment. And leaving doesn't necessarily refer to moving into your own house, although it usually does. But often in the first century in Jewish context, uh, the couple would come and live under the roof of the man's parents. So it didn't mean leaving at all, but it was an independence, an emotional break from them of setting up their own family unit, making decisions for themselves, which is very important. God is saying that the marriage relationship will be undermined if we have not stepped out from the authority of our parents. If somebody else is controlling the relationship other than the couple themselves, then pretty soon there will be big problems. Marriage needs to be built on an unreserved trust between the husband and the wife. Now secondly, um, the second phrase, to be united or to cleave to in the old translations. This phrase is talking about the commitment of marriage, that marriage covenant or promise that is made. Being united here speaks of a lifelong monogamous marriage. It's a permanent commitment between a man and a woman. And Jesus himself, of course, quotes from this very passage in Genesis later in Mark 10, in Matthew 19, saying that what therefore God has put together, people should not separate. Marriage is before God and it's his purpose for us. Marriage is for life. And it is the biggest commitment that we'll ever make, the biggest promise that we'll ever make to another person. And so we're to take those promises, that covenant, very seriously because God takes our marriage vows very seriously. And thirdly, they will become one flesh. Uh, this final phrase, the Christian idea of marriage is based on God's words that a man and his wife are to be regarded as one entity from that point. No longer two, but one. That's what the phrase one flesh would mean in modern English. Modern English, one entity. You know, the famous Irish uh, writer and speaker uh, C.S. Lewis once said this to um, ram home this point. The Christian believes, he said, that when God said this, he wasn't just expressing a nice sentiment, but he was stating a fact. Just like one is stating a fact when one says that a lock and its key are the one mechanism or that a violin and its bow are the one instrument. God, the creator of humanity, tells us that its two halves, male and female, were made to be combined, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. Now, of course, our sexuality is a big part of what is being expressed in this phrase, one flesh. One purpose of this one flesh, as we expressed earlier from Genesis 1.28, is to produce children. But it's more than that. It's not simply about that. Uh, it's also about the companionship, the compatibility between these two people. Now, sexuality is what binds uh, the marriage in many ways also. It's God's intended purpose for us as a sign and an expression of that inseparable union that we're to form. And so God's marriage pattern here is threefold. Leave our parents, be united to our spouse, become one flesh. But how would we summarise marriage on the basis of what we've seen in Genesis 1 and 2? Well, I'd define it this way. Marriage is an exclusive, lifelong, gendered union that is oriented towards children. All of those parts are important. An exclusive, lifelong, gendered union that is oriented towards children. And this union is a covenant. It's a binding contract. It's made through solemn promises that are done publicly for the sake of clarity about that relationship so that others know the step, the commitment that has been made by the couple. 
In conclusion, I want to make a couple of applications on the basis of all that about how we should view marriage, particularly as we think about the debate that is going to grow over these coming months. In a world that seems to swing between the extremes of mocking marriage as unnecessary altogether to the other end of the extreme, and that is idolising marriage, sticking it on a pedestal, that it will meet such needs that will never be met actually by it. Well, let's think of the first in terms of the derision that's often uh, shown and thrown upon marriage. It's often mocked by comedians. You know, if you, you see that in late night shows and so on. Have you heard the one about marriage being a three ring circus? You know, there's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and there's suffer ring. And, you know, and so they'll throw out these lines. And, and of course, even one of Australia's most respected social commentators, Hugh Mackay, um, who's offered social commentary on Australian life for many decades now, he has a very low view of marriage. If people are not mocking it altogether, they're undermining it by saying, oh, marriage is kind of something you take or leave. His most recent book, which he considers his opus, his biggest statement, is called Right and Wrong, How to Decide for Yourself. And in that book, he expresses his view of marriage this way. The right answer for me may be different to the right answer for you. What do we regard as an acceptable interpretation of the ideal of faithfulness? Do we mean being faithful to our sexual partner, having that person in an exclusive lifelong relationship? Or do we mean being faithful to ourselves? You know, married people will occasionally fall helplessly in love with someone else and feel that to ignore such powerful attraction would actually be wrong for them. Well, I guess that's an vote for adultery, isn't it, whenever it suits you? It's a, it's a very low view of marriage. Stay in the marriage relationship if you think that's best, but feel free to leave or do other things in the meantime. Well, I want to put it to you this morning. God's good design in marriage is so much better than this selfish whatever suits me approach, which is just dangerous in that it will only produce a recipe for many more broken relationships. This is not about taking the high moral ground even. It's about celebrating God's perfect blueprint, that what he offers is just so much better than what we think we know. Marriage is a good gift from God, not only for our well-being, for the expression of our sexuality, but actually for his purposes in this world. The raising of children, in part, is one of those in a stable and nurturing environment. Now, this gift of God has blessed all societies. Families established on this pa under this pattern are the stable building block of communities around the world. They have been era after era in every culture right around the globe. Countless millions have benefited from God's blueprint. On the other hand, there are those that don't want to deride or mock marriage, but they want to make it a commercial pedestal on which to stand. The wedding industry in Australia is booming. I don't know if you've noticed. Even if the rate of marriage is declining. You know, every Saturday brides are taken by limousines to churches and parks around Australia. And often now it's a weeknight or a Sunday wedding because... Well, reception centres are booked up years in advance. The reception centres are making a killing as well in all of this. And if you surf the net, there are a bewildering number of wedding planning websites with advice on everything for the big day. You know, Christine and I went to a very fancy reception a few years ago. It was held at Circular Quay, one of those um, beautiful restaurants looking right on the water. Um, as we came through the door, everyone was given their individual uh, champagne glass that was emblazoned with the couple's name and the date of the wedding. Uh, we had a barge that came into the bay there with fireworks that went off partway through the wedding. I mean, it was stunning. But it left me empty because it was such a showpiece. It was so fancy. But I wondered about whether the commercialization of the wedding day had become more important than the commitment that was being made. See, I think this commercialization provides just as much confusion as those who want to disregard marriage. 
It seems like the wedding day is a showpiece, as if it's the climax of the relationship rather than the start of a lifelong commitment. Now, the American writer Irving Stone once wrote, Story writers say that love is concerned only with young people and the excitement and glamour of romance ends at the altar. How blind they are. The best romance is inside marriage. The finest love stories come after the wedding, not before. See, again, let me encourage you to think that God's blueprint is such a wonderful gift. It's certainly not to be placed on a pedestal, though, that makes marriage all about the individual or the couple's self-fulfillment. You know, if we simply view marriage selfishly as something that exists only to serve our needs, the solution to our contentment and satisfaction in life, then it's going to let us down. It has to. And I think this approach explains a lot about the debate on marriage today. For it's seen as something that can just be at our whim. It's just about our benefit, our needs, our terms, according to our definition, if necessary. The problem is marriage wasn't designed to solve all the desires and needs of a person, to provide fulfillment for the hunger that we have for such things. That only makes an idol out of marriage. The fulfillment that we're looking for can only be found in a relationship with the creator God who made us in his image. That's what we're searching for. That's what people need. And marriage's place within that relationship with our eternal creator is that it be an exclusive, lifelong, gendered union that is oriented towards children and for the benefit of others. And above all, I would say, in the service of God. In the service of God. It's a serious covenant commitment. It's not just about us. It's about the people around that are served by that relationship and ultimately about serving God and his purposes for his world that he works out in part through both married and single people. But married people in their service of others, in their own children and in the wider society, which is given great stability out of his perfect blueprint. Will you join me in praying? Our Heavenly Father, uh, we acknowledge that marriage is a good gift because you designed it, but it's designed for the purposes for which you outlined in your word. And Lord, so often our society wants to divorce its meaning from these things. And that's not surprising given uh, much of our society uh, does not accept your authority or what your word has taught us. But Lord, we pray for us who uh, know the salvation that you offer in the Lord Jesus, uh, that we would not be turned aside by uh, arguments that undermine what you have so graciously granted us in marriage. Lord, help us to acknowledge what your perfect plan is, to hold on to it strongly to be able to express it clearly. And Lord, we ask above all that you might continue to help us and forgive us where we do go astray, where in our marriages uh, that are represented here today, we continue to struggle. We know that's because of our sinfulness that we fall short of your glory. So Lord, we ask that you might strengthen us by your spirit. Help us to serve one another not only our spouses, if we are married, but those around us too. And Lord, for those who are, are single here today, may um, they realise that all of us need, above all, a strong relationship with you, Lord. That marriage has its wonderful purpose in our society, but you created us all in your image to serve you. And one day we shall look forward to the wedding feast in heaven with our Lord Jesus, for indeed it's he to whom we are rightly engaged and to whom the consummation of that relationship awaits in heaven. 
Lord, may we focus on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.